Rebecca, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I have really spent my life wondering about whether God exists. And uh, uh, because I've never had a religious experience and don't particularly want one, <laughs> uh, I've really looked at arguments. And I've looked at all the arguments and thought about them a great deal. And I have to tell you, uh, your book, 36 uh, Arguments for the Existence of God, which is a wonderful novel, I focused on the appendix mm. because your appendix really dealt with an enormous number of, art, of, of, of arguments for the existence of God, and then you sought about to refute every one. Didn't you think one of them had some merit? Um, you know, I think some are better than others. Which did uh, you like? My favorite is probably number 35, <laughs> <laughs> which is the argument from the intelligibility of the universe. And mm. that's a very Spinozistic argument. Uh, it's to say, you know, it, it, it has basically one premise, which is that uh, it's, it's basically the principle of, of sufficient reason. For every every fact, there is a reason why it is a fact. That explanation goes all the way down. You know that joke about turtles yeah, all the yeah, way yeah, down? Yeah. Well, it's explanation all the way down. There's no brute contingency in the universe. And if you have um, just that one premise, uh, you're going to say that, well, the, the existence of the universe must itself have an explanation. That why, why these laws of nature rather than other laws of nature? I guess, you know, there's, and why is there something rather than nothing? All but of these things. There's a lot things. of different kinds of, the, the argument from intelligibility yeah. says that the universe uh, is intelligible in that we can know a great deal about it. And therefore, yes. some people infer that because we are we, that we can infer that there was a God who designed yes, it as such. Yes, I would say the way I understand the argument of intelligibility, which is the way Spinoza understood this principle of sufficient reason, which Leibniz went on to name, but he got it from Spinoza, is that there is an explanation for everything. It's not necessarily true that we can uh, access this explanation. In fact, Spinoza claims we can't. Uh, the explanation is infinite and we are finite. And so there's an absolute hmm. incompleteness theorem built into a Spinoza's worldview. But that the explanation exists is different from that we can get at the explanation or we even have any idea of what the explanation is. So the Argument for intelligibility says there is there is explanation going all the way down, which is not to say that we can progress down and get it. And if that's the case, then there is an explanation for the universe itself. Next step, it can't lie outside of the universe. Uh, it has to be the universe has to explain itself. Uh, it, it, it it's. Because what the universe basically is, is all explanations. It is all intelligibility. So there is nothing outside of the universe that can explain itself. So the universe contains its own explanation. It had to be. It is the thing that explains itself and its own existence. Spinoza says it's the casa sui, the thing that causes itself. Call it God. That's God, um, and that's what Spinoza means by saying God is nature. God is the final theory of everything. Mm. Um, that explains why it must be the final theory of everything, and which necessitates its own existence. That notion of God as the final theory of everything, I find very convincing. I find it as convincing as I find the principle of sufficient reason to be convincing. So to me, it's the best argument but it's not how most people think of God, which is why Spinoza was condemned as an atheist. Yeah, and so it's the best explanation that you see, but it doesn't lead to the kind of God that most people believe in. Absolutely it's a not. different definition of God. It, it defines the existence of the universe as this God or this necessary being. Exactly. A necessary exactly. existent thing exactly. that is, in, in Spinoza's view, yes. the universe, and some people take that view. Yes, and in fact, if that argument, which I'm not saying is a valid argument, but I find it the most cogent, the most convincing, you just have to make that big leap of believing in the principle of sufficient reason. Um, but that, if that argument is valid, it undercuts all the other 35 <laughs> arguments. Um, so it's in fact not 
not only do you not end up with the view of God of most religions or most religious people, it's inimical. It's, it's, it's inconsistent with those views because there can't be anything outside of the universe that created the universe. There, it, it's not a, um, a, a, an argument for a God that could enter into the course of history and change history. It completely uh, rules out miracles. Uh, it, it's not a moral God. It's the universe. It's the final. It's the string theorist notion of the final theory of everything. So, if I asked you of the other thirty-five, which was the worst argument, you might say all thirty-five put together. I think they're all they're pretty <laughs> bad. I mean, there are some that are really bad. Uh, for example, I can't remember what number seventeen may be. Um, the argument from the holy books. You know, we have holy books. They were written by God. Therefore, God exists. I mean, you know. A more cir viciously circular argument you couldn't dream up, but yet you hear these arguments. There, some of the arguments to me are very poignant. I've never seen them formulated, but I think that they're active in people's feelings about religion, and I wanted to really formulate them the way an analytic philosopher would, you know, premises. For example, the argument from the intolerability of insignificance. Um, I think that that's a very, very important <laughs> argument. I mean, how could uh, you know? How could we be so in insignificant in a million years? Nobody will know that we existed. Um, there must be. We must have a place in this universe. There must have been a designer uh, who confers significance on us. I mean, I find that poignant. It's a bad argument, but I find <laughs> it poignant. The argument from suffering. You know, if if there isn't a God, then all the suffering is for naught. That's pathetic. It's sad, it's, but, it it's sad. <laughs> but you know, these are arguments from wishful thinking. It's the fallacy of wishful thinking. And there are a whole bunch of the argument from answered prayers. I mean, there are a whole bunch of arguments uh, of this sort. The argument from miracles, which David Hume, I think, you know, gave the definitive refutation of. There are a lot of arguments <laughs> that <laughs> um, don't work. That don't work. Some more poignant than others. Uh, some uh, more intellectual. Some more emotional. Uh, I don't think any of them uh, are, are valid.